My Autism World Hello, I am autistic and I'd like you to better understand my world. Every autistic person is different, but hopefully this gives an insight into the things that can be challenging. If you met me, you would not see what I am experiencing, so you might be surprised at what goes on in my world. Enjoy this journey. Sensory issues. With sensory difficulties, it's not that I can hear, see or smell more than the average person, although I know some autistic people can. It's just that I'm more aware of things that other people ignore. I used to spend a lot of time in my school study hall, especially during the final year of secondary school, and I could never concentrate because I could hear chairs scraping, people eating, people talking, clothes rustling, birds, lawn mowers, the canteen staff, people walking by, keyboards clacking, folders and books and papers. Any other person who was mindful of their environment could hear these things too. However, where most people have to put conscious effort into tuning into their environment, I have to put conscious effort into tuning it out. Sound. Sensory issues can make conversation a little bit difficult. It can be hard to hear what people are saying over the cacophony of other sounds. For instance, if I go out for a walk with someone and I'm talking with them, I have to keep my hood down because it becomes significantly harder to hear them due to the fabric of the hood moving as I walk and move my head. If I'm washing my hands, I also can't hear anybody over the sound of running water. On top of that, if I'm playing a game or watching a movie and I want to concentrate on it, I have to shut my curtains and put on noise cancelling headphones or else I will be constantly drawn to the sounds and sights outside my window. Touch. Touch is the same. I am very aware, even at this very moment, of the places where my trousers and t-shirt touch my skin. I'm aware of the heat trapped by my hair and the skin on my cheeks moving ever so slightly as I move my head. Heightened sensitivity. Another area that affects my senses is heightened sensitivity. Like with not being able to tune out my environment, it's not that I can smell more, for instance, but that bad smells are far worse and good smells are much better. This has manifested itself in each of my senses in some way or another. Light. In terms of sight, I'm quite sensitive to bright lights. If I stare at a bright source of light, like a TV or computer for too long, I get a headache. This was quite a frequent problem in the past. Nowadays I keep the brightness of my computer way down and set a good distance away from my TV. Computer screens. If I used my Chromebook in school, my friend would sometimes comment that he could barely read anything on the screen because it was so dark. If I have my laptop on in the dark, I can barely look at it, so I need to keep my bedroom light on when I'm using it for no other reason than to drown out the light of the laptop a little bit. I often find myself squinting so much outside that I can barely see, which is a problem that becomes particularly pronounced in winter when the sun is low. Smell. Smell is another area where I experience heightened sensitivity. Whilst smells are not something I tend to notice most of the time, they are far more pronounced when I do notice them. Some places feel almost defined by their smells, like a person's house or room. Oddly, when I try to remember the inside of buildings, the smell is often what comes to mind first. Bad smells far worse and good smells even better. As a result, if I'm walking my dog and she does a number two, I have to position myself so that I'm out wind of it or I find myself gagging if I smell it, even for a moment, and be unable to pick it up. Noise. Sensitivity to sound is not something I've had too many problems with. Loud sounds certainly sound louder. I can't hear myself think if a bus passes by. But otherwise, sound is something that's largely in my control. If the volume on my headphones is too loud, I can turn it down quite easily, although now that I think about it, I can only listen to music at about 32 volume for a few minutes before it starts to become uncomfortable, and I often find myself fiddling around to make sure it's just loud enough, but not too loud, that it becomes uncomfortable. Temperature. Sensitivity to temperature is a particularly prominent part of my sensory sensitivity. Cold isn't too bad. It's something I can manage quite effectively with more layers of clothing and heating. It's heat that's the real problem. Hot food. My entire life I've had pretty strong aversion to hot food. If my food is steaming hot, I will barely be able to touch it, never mind put it in my mouth. As such, I've spent most of my life eating cold food. Nowadays I can manage warm food and prefer it most of the time, but hot food is still a struggle. Hot food and drinks too. Sometimes I've left soup for 15 minutes and still had to blow on it. I can't drink hot drinks like tea, hot chocolate or coffee either. I can barely touch a bagel that's fresh out of the toaster. And when I eat food, I usually devise some kind of strategy for coping with the heat, like cutting it in half and leaving it for a few minutes so the centre of it can cool down. 
Eat from other sources. Sometimes in school, I'd be in a situation where I needed to put my Chromebook on my lap. However, the bottom of it became unbearably hot, so I needed to put a folder under it or else put it on the floor. My friend said he didn't notice any heat. Hand washing. Water temperature can be a problem too. I can't wash my hands in anything more than warm water. Up until recently, I couldn't even do that. I just washed my hands in cold water and the result was often my skin cracking and bleeding due to the cold. Now I find myself constantly adjusting the taps when I'm washing my hands, trying to get the temperature just right. Sensory overload. To an ordinary person, this perhaps sounds maddeningly overwhelming, and to many people like me, it is. I think sensory overload was something I found challenging when I was younger. Upon getting outside, I'd be bombarded with so many sights and sounds and sensations that I would become extraordinarily excited. Nowadays, though, I think nothing of it. It's like being desensitised to it. Being able to feel the fabric of my clothes all the time is something I just accept. I might as well be tuning it all out at this point. I also find a bit of comfort in having some of the sensations I experience. Having my hands in my pockets and being able to feel the comforting, soft fabric of my clothes pushing around my hands is a comforting, like sleeping with a plush toy when you're a child, and it helps to alleviate stress in social situations. Nature. Some places are also a little easier to deal with than others. Nature is quite easy on the senses. There's something subdued about nature, a uniformity to it. There's just enough variety that it isn't dull, but not too much that it becomes overwhelming. Every leaf is green, the ground is always brown, the sparrows all sound the same, and running water always sounds the same. Because there isn't much variation, it's so much easier to process. Nature is slow, relaxed and quiet. As such, nature is an especially refreshing place to relax and think without having to process tons of sensations all the time. However, if a forest is quiet and relaxed, a city is like a hundred frantic people yelling different things all at once. Cities. Every car sounds slightly different, and there's always dozens of them at any given time. Buses and similar vehicles sound like an avalanche passing through. Every building is completely different from the one next to it. In nature, there's only a handful of sounds at a time, and a little variation on those sounds. But in a city, there's constant movement and new sounds all the time. In nature, you can easily take your time to process each sound, but a city is constantly moving and changing every second making it far more overwhelming and stressful, and all of this coming at you all at once. To get an idea of what this is like, imagine playing a dozen songs at the same time. At random, a song stops playing and a new one takes its place. That will give you some idea of what it's like. Holidays. This problem becomes particularly pronounced on holidays. Being thrown into what almost feels like an alien world brings with it an enormous number of new sensations. It's not just that you're having to process a ton of sensory information all at once. You're having to process all of this all the time. On holidays abroad, I often found myself being completely silent for long stretches of time, not engaging in conversation much and just sort of going with the motions. My mum said that she couldn't tell if I was enjoying the holiday or not. In reality, I was being bombarded with so much sensory information that it took all of my mental energy to deal with it, so not much room was left for anything else. Mindfulness. I find that mindfulness meditation is the most effective way, at least for me, to deal with these problems. I'm not quite sure how to properly articulate what the benefits of mindfulness and meditation are, but I will try my best. I think it encourages you to focus on just one sensation at a time, a process that is as much about feeling as it is about ignoring. If a session asks me to focus on the tips of my fingers, I have to concentrate and not think about the other parts of my body. It allows me to focus, to block out things that would have distracted me normally. In the short term, being able to focus on one thing rather than jumping from one source of stimulus to the next is pretty incredible and allows me to be far more productive than normal. But I've noticed that I've become better able to focus due to meditation and I'm able to embrace my heightened senses. Eye contact. Eye contact is a bit like figuring out what to do with your hands when you haven't got any pockets to put them in. You're constantly trying to find a place to put them that feels comfortable and natural, as well as one the other people involved in the conversation seem comfortable with too. 
Just maintaining eye contact is difficult because I've become self-conscious of the fact that I might be staring a little too intently and making the other person uncomfortable. On the other hand, not making eye contact makes it seem like I'm not paying attention to them, even if I am. Attention and eye contact. Attention is another thing. It's just difficult, in general, to stay focused on one thing for too long. Some other sight or sound is bound to drag your attention away. I think a big reason I personally can't make eye contact is that I can never escape the feeling of being judged when I make eye contact. Making eye contact means I'm more consciously aware of the person's eyes assessing me. Anxiety kicks in and I find myself critiquing absolutely everything about the way I'm presenting myself. So, not maintaining eye contact reduces this anxiety somewhat. Out of sight, out of mind, as they say. Crowds. In crowded places, this feeling becomes particularly stressful when you feel like dozens of pairs of eyes assessing every move you make. It almost feels like spiders crawling all over your skin. Keeping my gaze on the floor tends to mitigate this somewhat, but then I can't help looking up constantly because I see something moving or hear someone and lift my head to look at it, so it's not a perfect solution. This can become quite a bit of a problem when I'm in particularly busy places and I'm aware of hundreds, if not thousands of pairs of eyes. In such situations, I'd usually end up having a panic attack, which usually just involved hyperventilating and my thoughts descending into a static-like haze. However, you probably wouldn't have been able to tell I was having one at a glance. Escape. I think I was always aware that the only way I could get out of the crowd was to keep putting one foot in front of the other, which stopped me from having any kind of full-blown meltdown. I could always see a light at the end of the tunnel, and it kept me from getting too anxious. Although, now that I think about it, another factor may have been the fact that having a full-blown meltdown would just drag more attention to myself, which would surely make the panic attack worse. Perhaps I was aware of that and tried to keep the panic under control. It's hard to know what I was going through in my head when I was like that. It's a bit like trying to remember what you were thinking in the moments before you fall asleep. Body language. One of the biggest contributors to feelings of anxiety in social situations is the fact that I struggle to read people's body language. I remember reading somewhere that between 70% and 90% of all human communication is non-verbal. Most people can read body language subconsciously, but I have to do it consciously. This creates a lot of anxiety because it's impossible to tell how I'm coming across or what the other person might be thinking once they're talking to me. Conversation. This leads to me becoming more critical of what I'm doing or saying, which leads to me trying harder to pick out how the other person is feeling, which makes me even more critical of how I'm coming across. It's this feedback loop that amplifies anxiety more and more each time. Trying to talk to someone feels a lot like shooting in the dark because it's difficult to tell if they're finding what I'm saying engaging. I tend towards trying to talk about topics I'm knowledgeable about, but these aren't things that most people care about, and if anybody does share my interests, it's probably not the same degree of intensity. Conversation. In the past, I talk about myself or my interests with little success, so nowadays I prefer to let other people do the talking for a number of reasons. It takes the pressure off me to keep the conversation going, which reduces anxiety. Although, I think the big reason I like doing this is that I just enjoy picking other people's brains. I spend so much time alone that when I actually get to talk to somebody else, I just want to hear about them and hear their perspective on the world. Conversation. It's probably why I spend so much time watching YouTube videos. It feels like I'm having a conversation with somebody, even though I don't have to talk, and they're usually talking about things I'm interested in. To be honest, if given the chance, I probably would ramble on about the things I enjoy for hours and hours and hours, but the desire to take the chance to hear someone else's perspective is a bit more powerful than that urge nowadays. Besides, it is nice to just have the chance to dump your thoughts on someone, so at the very least it feels nice to give other people the chance to do that. Conversation. However, even though I'm aware that I prefer engaging with people like this, I rarely ever do it. I don't get the chance to talk to people very often, especially not people I don't know very well, and it's quite challenging to think of questions to ask. If the other person is talking about profits I'm not particularly knowledgeable on, this becomes particularly challenging. Another reason for this is that I find it hard to think clearly when I'm scared. I remember once I played a particularly terrifying video game and had to stop because I was too scared to solve any of the puzzles anymore. Conversation. Because of that, I struggle to understand what people are saying and think about it enough to know what questions to ask. However, it's something I want to work on in the future.
I think another big thing I only noticed recently is that I can never tell when someone is done talking or when they're about to start talking. The result is that I constantly feel like I'm speaking over people or interrupting them. Understanding emotions in others. Reading other people's emotions can often be quite challenging. I can generally tell what someone is feeling if it's obvious. I can tell when someone is happy or excited generally, but other more complex emotions can be a bit more challenging. Many emotions can manifest themselves in many different ways in many different people. I can generally tell when someone is angry, more based on the way they are breathing than anything, but something like sadness is a lot harder to pick out. The most obvious sign of sadness is crying, but crying isn't always a bad thing, and it's not like people start bawling their eyes out every time they become a little sad. The signs are usually far more subtle and are consequently much harder to pick up. Cartoons Because I struggle to pick up on body language, I've always preferred watching cartoons over live action. You can't put the same nuance into cartoon characters, so animators need to make their emotions a lot more obvious. Because I can more easily pick up on a cartoon character's emotions, I can empathise and connect with them a lot more than a live action character. We often get to hear what they're thinking, a lot like in a book, and their emotions are far more exaggerated. Video games. Video games are the same. Older games and low budget games haven't got fancy graphics and can't put much nuance into characters either, so more needs to be communicated through dialogue. However, the unique thing about video games is that they create empathy in very different ways to TV or movies. Some games make the player feel the same emotion as the character they're playing as, which allows you to understand the character on a much deeper level than you normally would get. It helps with learning about the body language too, because I already know how they're feeling and then get to see their body language in response to those feelings. Books. It's quite easy to connect with characters and books as well. Books put less focus on body language and allow you to hear everything the character is thinking, just about all of the time, so you don't even need to worry about body language. However, many books don't ignore this entirely, so you can read a character's body language, then hear what they're thinking, which helps with learning to understand what certain cues mean. TV slash film. And my ability to understand body language has improved over the years. I recently watched a live action series called Breaking Bad and was struck by the fact that I usually understood what all of the characters were thinking or feeling. Although I think that has more to do with how good the story and performances are in that show. Plus, it's easier to tell what someone is feeling in a movie or TV show because they go through these extreme, larger than life situations that make them feel stronger emotions that are easier to pick up on. When a character is getting held at gunpoint by a psychopathic drug dealer, it's obviously pretty easy to figure out what they're feeling. A conversation about the weather doesn't exactly elicit a very strong reaction. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to this presentation about my autism world. I hope this has been helpful and has given you a better understanding about the autistic people you know.